All right, well, uh, hello, how's everybody? Um, I wanna thank you for tuning in. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, COVID-19 vaccinations and how it will be done in the city of Cleveland through our health department. Those things that we'll be responsible for. And, and uh, the first phase for us is um, phase, what we're calling phase 1A, and, and that, um, uh, will be really the vaccination of the paramedics and EMTs that work in the divisions of uh, EMS fire and airport fire rescue. That, that is the main uh, group. I forget how many people uh, uh, that is, but uh, uh, that's where we're going. Now, with me today to talk about uh, not only the short range uh, immediate phase of uh, phase 1A is uh, uh, interim director Kimball and uh, the commissioner of the environment, Patrick Kusick. Now, uh, the commissioner is also our um, distribution manager. So he'll be in charge of, um, of the actually getting the infrastructure that we set up to distribute. He will be the one that will be in charge, in charge of that. Now, the Department of Public Health has uh, received its vaccines and that um, we are going to be following the CDC and the state of Ohio's uh, guidelines in terms of how it will be uh, distributed. Uh, as I just mentioned, for us, uh, the city of Cleveland, through our health department, it will be the paramedics and EMT with uh, fire EMS and uh, airport uh, fire rescue a squad. Um, now there is a part of that first phase, but not with us, uh, but with the hospitals are their first, their front line of people who are working in the hospitals and also the congregate living places, uh, the staff and, uh, and the residents there. And I believe they're partnering with um, uh, CVX and, um, and Walgreens. Now we're not part of that. Uh, they're, they're handling that separately. Our role here uh, as we move into our first phase is again with our, our EMTs and paramedics. Now, um, uh, the director and the commissioner will give you some details as to the first phase. And then um, after the first phase or even during the first phase, we're already strategizing on creating and the infrastructure to have broader distribution as more and more uh, categories of the populations are identified as being um, able to receive the vaccine, which could uh, mean as, as many as six locations throughout the city of Cleveland that we will be working uh, with partners to help in the distribution of, of the vaccine. Now, for the director and commissioner speak, I want to say to you that uh, we have over 17,000 confirmed cases in the city of Cleveland over, over this 10 month period, and we have 180 deaths. So I, I want to express that the pandemic is not over. It is not over, even with the vaccine becoming available, the pandemic will not be over. So it is very important that we continue, even with the vaccine, continue to follow the basic rules. That is stay at home, unless you absolutely have to go out for essential purposes. If you go out, wear a mask, keep social distance, and wash your hands uh, constantly. So I will turn it over to uh, Director Kimball, and then uh, he will turn it over to the commissioner, and then we'll follow up with your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon all. I'm Brian Kimball, Interim Director for Cleveland Department of Public Health. Uh, the mayor made a good point. Uh, the pandemic is not over. This uh, vaccine that we were in receipt of, uh, is just one more tool in our tool belt. We still have to adhere to social distancing. We still have to wash our hands frequently. Uh, we have to follow all the rules that are necessary to keep us safe. And we have to always maintain our masks. So as we move to this next phase, we'll begin to provide vaccines to 
those that are our frontline workers. Uh, we are in receipt of the Moderna vaccine. Uh, the uh, Moderna vaccine, uh, we're, we're ecstatic to have that. Uh, again, it's one more tool in our tool belt. Uh, the Moderna vaccine uh, we're in receipt of. Uh, we'll be we'll be we will store this. Uh, <clears throat> we're not required to. This does not require our uh, sub-zero storage, so we are uh, able to store this in our normal uh, laboratory refrigerations. Uh, the Moderna vaccine can be administered to individuals 18 years or older. And as we move into our first phase, our goal is really to reduce the spread. We are have priorities set by the state and the CDCs uh, for our first phase. Uh, those are residents uh, that live in residents and staff in nursing homes, residents and staff that are living uh, assistant living. In addition to that group, we are also focused on uh, people with. Uh, persons with developmental disabilities, those with mental health disorders, including substance and, dis and, and, and su including substance abuse disorders, those persons that are living in group homes, residential facilities, or centers and staff in those locations. In addition to that is our EMS and EMT workers, and that is the group in which we're going to start with. Uh, on Thursday of this week, we will begin to provide vaccine to that, that group. Uh, these are uh, our primary, uh, this is our first initiative. And as we move on through the phase 1A, we will be identifying other groups to provide the vaccine to. As, as the mayor mentioned, long-term care facilities. There are a number of long-term care facilities in congregate livings that are registered with the state or federal programs, and the vaccines will be provided to them uh, through that program. The others that are listed or that I listed uh, will be our responsibility. And as, as we get closer to identifying the next group that we will be providing vaccines to, we will be communicating that information out to the public. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn this over to our uh, commissioner, uh, Pat Cusack. He's going to go over some of the details around how we're going to distribute uh, the vaccines to our first line. Thanks, Commissioner. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Hi, I'm Pat Cusick. I'm the commissioner of environment for the Cleveland Department of Public Health. Uh, I formerly worked in emergency preparedness, so we've been planning to distribute medications and vaccines to the entire population of Cleveland for two decades now. We are rolling out what's called a point of dispensing or a vaccination pod uh, to touch the first responders. We will be working through uh, the approximately 1,200 individuals who fill those roles and fit the CDC criteria in this first vaccination pod. So we will work with scheduling and getting those services in so that they don't impact services to the community during that. These are our first responders and they have very heavy responsibilities every day. We will staff the pod with Cleveland Pub Public Department of Health employees who've done these roles and we have done a training and orientation for those individuals who will fill those roles. As we expand these operations and have additional vaccine and additional groups we can give it to, congregate facilities and some of the other agencies that do support services, we will be expanding each one of these. Every level that we expand, we will staff up and follow these same procedures so that we can get all of the public vaccinated as the vaccine becomes available for each of those groups. Uh, we anticipate getting the flow through the very first groups through uh, in with their scheduling so that we maintain city services over a six day period and we will take any questions and address those issues as they come up. Thank you. Okay, uh, questions. Hey, Mayor. The first question comes from Sia Nakor from WOIO. Will Mayor Jackson get the vaccine when it is available in Cleveland? If yes, when? If no, why not? The question is, uh, will I get the vaccine? and? And if yes, when, if no, why not? 
Uh, yes, I will get the vaccine and I will wait my turn. So whenever it's my turn, then I'll, I'll get my shot. The next question is from Taylor Haggerty from WCPN. The new stimulus package does not appear to include funding directly for local governments. Where does the city stand financially without additional assistance? Well, the question is, uh, the new stimulus package coming out of Washington does not include a state and local government funds. So where do we stand financially, I guess, in the midst of all this? Um, we're, um, they were finalized. I just had a conversation with my finance director earlier today, and we're finance, uh, finalizing the, the budget uh, for the rest of this year. We will be balanced out this year. And we're, we will be presenting a balanced budget uh, next year. That budget will, however, have a reduction in revenue associated with uh, more about the actual amount of revenue we collected uh, this year. Uh, we know that um, the cost will be um, uh, probably exceed that revenue. So we are looking at um, how do we carry over enough money to uh, to fill that gap into next year. So it won't be a structurally balanced, but it will be balanced uh, in uh, financially according to the law. Now, uh, in the midst of all that, we are building this new infrastructure uh, in terms of uh, setting this up for the vaccine, which will um, allow, which will call for us to have to spend money that, uh, that uh, uh, that we had unanticipated, we had not anticipated. Uh, but that being said, uh, we will set this up, we'll move ahead, and then uh, as our anticipation and hope is that uh, next year there will be uh, additional money coming into state and local governments. And just as uh, it's been done this year, it will be applicable to costs incurred as a result of the COVID-19, which will help us cover the cost of setting up this new infrastructure. So that's where we are. Okay, the next question is from Cameron Fields from Cleveland.com. How many vaccinations do you expect to receive in the city from Pfizer and Moderna this week and next week? Um, question is how many vaccines we expect to get this week and next week, uh, Director Commissioner? So a number of vaccines or doses that we're receiving will be from Moderna. Uh, we are in receipt of 4,000 doses. The next question is from Eric Biggs. Why are we not making companies in Cleveland report the COVID cases to their employees due to having families that can be exposed? Well, I don't know if that's a, something that the state is requiring or not. I know that we're not requiring it. That, uh, um, uh, and the question is, why are we requiring employers to report to, to, uh, to employees that they've been exposed uh, or that someone, I guess, in the company has uh, COVID? virus and how are, why aren't they telling everyone else in that company? I don't know. I don't believe that we have that as a rule. We do not, we do not have that as a rule. And the question is why? And, and that is that we um, leave that up to the companies. And, and because we get um, we get information as to who is uh, has been um, infected. And then we do our verification of that. And then we do the tracing of that. And do we report that to the company? We, well, no, we don't. Uh, there are times when we do. So there are times when we are in correspondence, uh, communications with those businesses with positive cases. Uh, and for those, uh, we do direct them uh, that uh, it, it would be good practice for them to uh, communicate in some way uh, that they there are, are experiencing uh, or have identified uh, positive cases in their facility. Uh, it's not a requirement for us, uh, but we do advise them that would be somewhat of a, a best practice for them. And, and so that you know, when we do our enforcement uh, and we find out, particularly if it's um, an entertainment venue, like bars or restaurants, or, um, 
uh, things like that, and we find that there is either someone, uh, a customer uh, who has been infected or an employee who has been infected, we then uh, and, uh, say to the owner of that establishment that they have to um, close until they sanitize their establishment. And once they demonstrated that they have sanitized it, then they're allowed to reopen. But as the uh, director said, uh, we encourage them, but it's not mandated. Okay, Mayor, the next question is from Jordan Vandenberg from News 5. And he actually stated he had a question for Chief Williams. Last week, you told City Council Safety Committee that 160 officers have been out the past few weeks because of COVID-19. Now, three more officers are on restricted duty because of pending criminal cases. How would you characterize the current staffing level at the Division of Police? Well, the question is, uh, was uh, one of the director to the chief, and since he's not here, I'll attempt to answer your question, is that last week at Council, the chief said that there was 160 officers who were out in some COVID-related thing and that there are three officers on restricted duty pending some criminal charges. And how do we uh, how do we view our staffing in order to deal with whatever is going on uh, in the city of Cleveland in, in terms of police? Um, it's a challenge, just like anything. I imagine if you went to um, the hospitals who um, just one of them is my understanding has over a thousand people who are impacted by the uh, COVID virus and, and COVID-19 virus, and they are unable to come to work. And as a result of that, uh, the people who are coming to work are many times working double and, and, and sometimes triple shifts in order to do the work. So the same thing applies here. You get the job done uh, with the personnel that you have. Um, if it were not for the COVID stuff, uh, COVID-19 infections, then that, that mean 160 officers would be on the job. Uh, in terms of three who are under some possible criminal charges, that's a drop in the bucket and that wouldn't make that much of a difference, but 160 does, but we just step up. Uh, the same way the, uh, a business would step up if they were obligated to perform on goods and services based on the contract, they would have to step up in order to meet that obligation. The same with the healthcare industry and, and the hospitals and the medical industry when uh, they have people who are affected and they're down uh, again with one hospital, at least over a thousand, um, they have to step up. You just have to do what you have to do. It's no different than for us. We just step up and do what we have to do. Or is it is it better to have the people? Yes. Is it um, less efficient because you don't have it? Yes but that doesn't stop the show you still have to perform the next question is from connor morris will the city of cleveland be shutting off the water or electric electricity of cleveland public power or water customers during the winter months if they are behind on their bills you know, i think there's a policy in place around the winter months i'd have to check on that uh there may be some uh, policy around not doing shutoffs during winter months. I don't know for sure, but I'll check on that. But if you also referring to uh, the fact that we sent out notices uh, on December 1st to people that uh, we uh, that it's time to pay your bills and that um, those who are uh, who are eligible, we are referring them and helping them go through programs where there are dollars available to help pay for those bills. Uh, those back bills and 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 uh, to get on programs if they have income um, uh, uh, eligibilities and they meet that uh, on programs that would help to minimize that bill their bills going forward uh, there are many people who were uh, we reconnected who had not paid their bills even before COVID uh, whether they were in clean public power or the water bills uh, these were people who were just not paying their bills even before COVID. What we decided to do then is just to reconnect them, uh, whether they had been pre-COVID or, or, or not. But those who, are, who lost their income or unable to pay uh, because of uh, the COVID, uh, then we work with them to help them catch up. 
And then if they're still unable to pay, then we work with them to identify uh, programs to help them pay. And um, um, as we look at this and we review this on a monthly basis, you know, we may alter that one way or another, but but uh, right now we're in the mode, as I just mentioned to you. The next question is from Gerard Henderson. If the flu numbers are so low, how is the COVID numbers high? Well, uh, you'd have to, if the flu numbers are so low, how is COVID so high? You'd have to talk to a doctor for that or epidemiologist or somebody, but I would suspect that uh, the flu numbers are down because people are wearing these doggone masks, they're washing their hands, they're keeping social distancing, you see, and they're, and they're cleaning their surfaces, they're cleaning. So that helps to prevent the flu. But the virus is a much, uh, is a different creature. It is more, it is more aggressive and it's more infectious. It's easier to catch it. Uh, so I would imagine that just following the basic rules to prevent the spread of the virus has a significant impact on people uh, getting the flu. Or if, would you? That's a flu leader. Or, and the director, <laughs> said, the director says I'm right. The next question is from Robert Matthew Corby. Will, this, will the city of Cleveland be transferring additional funds to Cleveland Housing Network so that they can accept applications again? Uh, the city of Cleveland, will the city of Cleveland be transferring funds to Cleveland Housing Network so uh, they can take applications? This goes back to the question about your rent, the water bill, sewer bill, uh, uh, electric bill, all of that. We put money into that in order to help people make it through the COVID if they've lost their job uh, and, and they have, don't have income uh, to help uh, them work through this. And, um, and the question is, will we provide additional money to clean out? We will provide money to help people. I'm not saying we're going to give it to the housing network. We'll give it to whoever it is that can perform the job. And so uh, the housing network was the vendor that is working, I think, on the rental assistance. And I believe that they're also doing something around uh, utility bills. And we will be evaluating them, not only in terms of the number of people that they that they uh, dealt with, but also the quality of that work, where the people have fallen through the cracks. And if they have not done their job, we'll find another vendor. If they have done their job, then we will work with them as, as additional money comes in. Uh, we'll work with them to continue what they're doing and may find additional vendors also to assist in that, depending on what the demand is and what uh, the housing network's capacity is. Uh, one of the issues that um, came up most recently that is all related to whether or not we we're going to do cutoffs and whether or not people are going to be access money is their ability to to uh, have the capacity to process the number of applications coming in based on what they have to do to draw down money, not just from us, but from uh, the feds or the state or whoever. So we're evaluating uh, what their process is and whether they have the capacity uh, to perform at the level we would like it to be. The next question is from Cameron Fields from cleveland.com. With some vaccines already administered last week, how many healthcare workers in the city of Cleveland have been vaccinated? How many healthcare workers in the city of Cleveland have been vaccinated? I do not know. That would be a, a question you would have to ask the, um, the Cleveland Clinic, University Hospital, Metro Health, and Sisters of Charity. Um, they would uh, let you know how many of they have vaccinated. Uh, and uh, and they would also probably be able to tell you how many of them refused the vaccination too, if they would choose to tell you that. But uh, you would have to ask them in regards to that. We do, we can report out once uh, we go through this. We're going to start on uh, uh, Christmas Eve, and I think it's a six day operation where we're scheduling all our paramedics and EMTs to come in in our first phase. And, and we can tell you how many we have vaccinated out of how many, you know, if there's X a number, how many of that number actually 
came in and said they wanted the vaccination. And so we'll be able to tell you that. And then as we go out and we deal with the second part of this and identifying those um, congregate living situations where uh, they did not register with to get the help from uh, Walgreens and CVX, then we're they're just falling back on us. So we have to identify who they are and begin to work with those uh, uh, organizations to see if we can uh, get their people vaccinated. And we, we know that there's probably about oh, 2,000 or so uh, people who are eligible in those areas that have not registered as they should have with the state that we will be responsible for. And so we're putting the infrastructure together to identify these agencies and, and how do we get to them and vaccinate their people and who would want it and who would not want it. Okay, Mayor, this is the final question from Ariel Weisenberger. Do restaurant workers have the right to refuse service to people who come in without a mask or to people who come in saying that they have had the COVID um, because they could still be spreading it. Um, the question is, do restaurant workers have the right to deny service to people who are not wearing a mask or have communicated that they they have been infected, even though they may not be displaying symptoms? I assume that's what they mean. I, um, I, I if I was a restaurant worker, I would certainly um, do that. Now, what their boss would do if uh, in terms of them refusing to serve that person, that's another question of which we do not have any authority over. Uh, so, I, uh, the director, is there any rules in regards to that? There is no, there's no, there's no, there's no pardon me. So, right. So, go ahead. Go ahead. so, in our local ordinances, we do have rules regarding service in public establishments right now under the emergency authorizations. And those are in place. So masks, wearing a mask until you're seated, those are the pieces that we're currently doing. But whether a business can refuse service, businesses have the right to refuse service to anyone. That's a longstanding uh, sign I see posted when I walk into places. It's their business. We try to give them the best public health information and the guidance on that, how to help their customers and their staff stay safe. But that's where we kind of have to draw the line. And, and on, on that point, uh, not that point, but in, in the general context of what was asked and answered is that we're extending our the mayor's emergency, the mayor's proclamation uh, to the end of January. So I, I signed that today. And, and as you know, we do it month by month, depending on what's going on. So it's basically an extension of um, what we've uh, have had in place going in the past, we now have extended it to uh, uh, the end of January. And it's in line with um, uh, what uh, the state is doing, the governor's uh, uh, mandates, and also our, our local ordinances and, and mandates around uh, establishments and masks and all that other stuff. Any other questions? There are a couple more coming in. The next one is from Dave, Damon Appel. Why is the city of Cleveland not emphasizing the dangers of taking the rushed vaccines based on Enderma technology, excuse me, based on mRNA technology, mm -hmm. which has never before been released to the public anywhere at any time? Uh, the question is, why isn't the city of Cleveland, I guess, advocating the danger of taking a vaccine that this questioner is, says has been rushed and based on new technology, MRA uh, um, uh, technology and approach. Why are we doing it? Uh, we're not doing it because there is, someone has to have uh, some confidence in the process uh, and that we're in the middle of a pandemic and people are dying every day, if not in Cleveland, somewhere and uh, emergency rooms are full, the uh, intensive care units are full, and, um, and, and this vaccine is going through, even though an expedited 
um, uh, process. It, it has gone through those levels of approval that have demonstrated the safety. Now, I will say this where the, where the questioner is absolutely right. It has demonstrated safety in terms of the short run uh, and that there in terms of short run that those who are part of the trial and those who have received a vaccine have some minor side effects, but there is no long, there is no major um, uh, reaction uh, from the vaccine, but that's in the short run. Uh, you really, uh, to the questioner's uh, point, you really won't know about the long range uh, effect of this for another three, four, five years. And, and if there is something based on this new technology uh, that has been uh, researched for years, is my understanding, but this is the first time it has been used in terms of a vaccine, this MR. Uh, a uh, technology or approach to life, uh, uh, there's no real understanding as to what the long-term effect would be. So with those two things out there, and the fact that, um, uh, like a man told me the other day, um, and I know this is related to just a small group of people, but the man told me he was 93 years old. And I said, uh, well, are you gonna take the vaccine he said, yeah, I would take it. I said, well, you know, they can prove the short-term benefits, but there's no proof yet of the long-term, whether or not in long-term this size of it. He said, I'm 93. And if it, if, 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 uh, and if, if it takes seven years for me to get the negative effect, he said, I'd be 100 if I'm still around. So the, the sense of urgency with him was, give me the vaccine. I'll deal with the long-term stuff later on. And there are a lot of people who feel the same way, even though they may be younger. They may be younger. They may say, you know, I'm, I, I know short term I'm okay. I don't know what the long term effects would be, but I do know that I know somebody who has died from this. I know somebody who has been infected and, and they have long term uh, uh, complications where they're never the same again. And, and, and so that's why we give people choices. If you don't want to take it, that's fine. And that's what we do. I'm not advocating uh, saying that uh, uh, that uh, 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 that uh, this is dangerous and you shouldn't do this. I'm not a scientist. I just know what I just told you. That's what I know. And 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 but I'm going to take it uh, and I'm going to uh, deal with whatever happens as a consequence of me taking it. But I am going to take it because uh, it is the proper thing to do and the right decision at this time. Next from Carla Wathers, is the city working with city transit in regard to enforcement of wearing masks while Are riding? we working with RTA, RTA in enforcing masks? I imagine if they asked us to, but they have their own police department and they have their own enforcement mechanism, so I'm, uh, I would imagine that they would, um, if they were having some difficulty with a, uh, a passenger who was not wearing their mask, they do like they would do any time. If they have some difficulty, they would uh, uh, they would call their police department, who responds pretty quickly. The next question is from Damon Appel. Do you only ever answer questions that support the city's continued unconstitutional violation of civil liberties? It said, do I only answer questions that support the city's unconstitutional enforcement of anti-civil liberty? I don't know what you're talking about, to be honest with you. Um, we answer questions that you ask. If you have a question specifically, then, then, then I will answer that. In terms of us supporting something that is against the Constitution and the, and the individual's liberties, we don't do that. Uh, there, there are times when people challenge us as to whether or not uh, what we did was proper or improper, and, and we have disagreements. And many times those disagreements play out in the court system. Uh, and, some, and many times we lose, and there's sometimes we, uh, many times we win. But if you have a specific question about an incident, I'll gladly answer that. All right, Ms. Cynthia Barner, children 17 and older are young adults, but they did not get a check from the government. What do you think about that? 
I, what I think is irrelevant about whether or not someone 17 years old got a check from the government. Uh, you know, the question is 16, 17 years old didn't get a check from the government. What I think about it is irrelevant. The, the, they passed the, 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 uh, the legislation. It's very specific as to who's eligible, who's not. I do know if, if you, uh, in a certain income guideline, you get a certain amount of money. And if you have children who are in your household that are still minors, you get money for them too. So they're going to, maybe they don't get the check directly, but their parents get it or their guardians. It's so you know, it's, it's just the rules. You got to, it's just the rules. Deborah Hector, why is foreign aid in a U.S. citizen COVID relief bill? I do. Why is foreign aid in a U.S. citizen? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, what y'all are asking me about are things around policy and the politics, <clears throat> the politics of uh, Washington, D.C., and whether or not you're a liberal or conservative, whether you're right wing or you left wing. And I am, in, to me right now, I could care less about any of that. I'm trying to deliver vaccines to people who want vaccine to help save their life and to create an environment here that would prevent people from getting infected by COVID-19, causing them to, to uh, uh, be in a bad health condition or losing their lives, passing it on to their loved ones. And if now we're focusing on setting the infrastructure so that we can dispense uh, vaccines to people who want them. Now, if you have uh, political agendas and ideological differences, y'all need to discuss that with yourself. I am talking about serving the people of the city of Cleveland and to helping them go through this pandemic and this crisis that we're in. And with that, if we do that and do it properly, our economy will come back around. And when our economy comes back around, people will get employed. Then we don't have to worry about the utilities getting cut off, their, their water, or the electric, or, or sewer, any of that stuff. So y'all have that dispute and debate among yourselves. I, I really don't care. And that's it, Mayor. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.